This morning, I want you to imagine something with me, okay? I want you to imagine that you go to work on a Monday morning. And, you, and so you can picture wherever it is that you work, and as you, or where you've worked, okay? Whatever works for you. Uh, and you walk into that place. Now, some of you, I'm, I'm going to comment on retired people for a minute. You've still got places where you work, okay? You have a special place that's yours, all right? So for all of us, think about that place where you work, and you walk into your workshop or to your kitchen or to your backyard. Uh, you walk to, up to your cubicle or your cash register, uh, into your office or your classroom, whatever that is. You walk to your space, and there's someone else standing there or sitting there. Thank goodness. <laughs> there's, that's not the point of the story. You're supposed to be mad about it. <laughs> And so you walk in and say you're, and you walk in, there's someone at your desk, and they've taken your family pictures down already, and they put up their family pictures, right? And, and you look over there in the trash can, and there's all your stuff. You know, your plaques and your, uh, your whatever sports thing it is you had in your office, you know, that's in the trash can, and all of that stuff is over there. And this person is totally taken over, and they're taking phone calls, and their name's on the desk. Or maybe if you're, if you're a teacher, you walk in and there's someone else teaching your class. Now, <laughs> you totally ruined it for me, Heather. Thank you. Um, when, how most of us would respond, I thought, is that we'd be mad about it, right? You'd have a moment where you think, man, I thought I was in charge. Who in the world are you? Because you have ownership over your classroom or your space or whatever. And how do you know they're, they're going to do a good job or not? And who are they? I sort of had a moment like this this past Friday because I had visited with a family and met with them and I was uh, doing a funeral for the, this family and I showed up at the, at the funeral and there was another pastor there. I was like, what? Turns out the family had somehow, I still haven't finished investigating the mystery, somehow the, the family heard that I had the flu and so they had gone and found another pastor. Which, which is okay, right? But what bothered me was I was thinking, well, you know, I worked really hard on trying to do a good job for this service. I don't know if this other pastor even knows the family. And I felt bad for them that they had scrambled and whatever. So I was not super happy about it. Um, so anyway, I talked to the pastor and it wasn't his fault. He had just been asked to come and lead. And so, you know, we quickly put something together and we did it together. And everybody thought it was supposed to be that way. Um, but here's my point. I did have a moment where I thought, wait a minute, I thought this was supposed to be my job. And so uh, we kind of do that because we think we're in charge. And we do that with our lives, right? I mean, I know that it's hard and it's difficult when bad things happen to you or stuff that happens beyond your control, but every time that happens, that's a gift. Because when something happens to you that's beyond your control, it's a reminder that you're really not in charge, right? And it's, an, and it's an opportunity to acknowledge that and to say, yes, Lord, that's right, I'm not. Because we kind of, we run around, we do our things, and, we can, and we've been given temporary, temporary authority, and we allow ourselves to think that's permanent and to think we're ultimately in charge. I mean, to use the, the teacher analogy, imagine, and this is a little bit more like what our life is like, imagine that you're a, a long-term substitute. But it's such long term that you've been doing it for several years. And so you walk into class one day and there's somebody else in front taking attendance and taking charge. And you say, hey, who in the world are you? And, they, and that person says, well, I'm the original teacher. And you say, oh, right? This is a little bit more of what happens to us when things happen in our lives and we think, oh, we get angry because we're not in control. And then we realize, wait a minute, maybe the person who's actually in control just took charge. And maybe I should let him. And so we come to this story in Luke chapter 20. And let me tell you what has just happened. And this is all connected. This is all a big deal. If I could keep you all here for five hours and show you how, how all of this connects together, I would do that. But what I have to do instead is give you chapters. Okay? But if you can read all of this together, you'll see how it all fits together. Here's what happens. Jesus goes into Jerusalem. And he goes into Jerusalem as not just a king, but as the Messiah. 
the anointed one, the one who is, who is going to be like David but greater than David. And the people start praising him. And the Pharisees are mad about it. They're mad about it because they thought they were in charge. In fact, they've been mad about Jesus for a while now, and they've already been plotting to kill him because that's how jealous they are for their own position. Sometimes I think that people uh, who think they're actually in charge of their own lives will get so mad about the fact that they're not, they'll plot to destroy their own lives. And so here they are, and they're angry, and they're willing to kill to keep their illusion of authority. And so uh, he comes in, and they're praising him, and they're praising him as king. And the Pharisees say, teacher, tell them to shut up. And Jesus, does, Jesus says, if they don't cry out, the rocks themselves will cry out. Because what he's saying is basically this, I deserve it. And not only do I deserve it, but God, will, God himself will see to it that I get the praise that I deserve. And so his disciples are singing praises to him, and they're quoting from the Psalms, and they're super excited, and they're, sing and they're crying out, Hosanna, which means, save us now. And they clearly believe that their salvation had rode in on that donkey. And they, were, and they were happy about it, and they were thrilled. And then Jesus goes straight to the temple. He walks into the temple, and he walks into the court of the Gentiles, and there is... Now, there are two religious groups who are in charge of the Jews in that day. Okay, so when we speak of Jewish leaders, there were two primary groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, these two groups didn't really like each other all that much. Okay? They reluctantly shared power. Uh, it, would, it would be, I mean, a legitimate analogy would be like Republicans and Democrats. Okay? They, they begrudgingly shared power. So both Pharisees and Sadducees sat on the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. So they begrudgingly had to get along, but they didn't really get along, but they had to rule together. Okay? But here, all of a sudden, the Pharisees and the Sadducees agree about something. We all hate Jesus because he was taking their authority. Because though they kind of wrestled and, and jostled with the other side, the Pharisees with the Sadducees and vice versa, they at least, you know, together shared power. And now this Jesus comes, comes along and he wants to wipe us all out. He wants to be in charge. And so they have been plotting to kill him. So Jesus walks in and he clears out the court of the Gentiles. Now they've been buying and selling and they have been changing money. Now, the people who are in charge of the temple were the Sadducees. That was their job. And so there, what Jesus does there is a direct attack on the authority of the Sadducees. Because not only were they the ones in charge of the money, they were the ones in charge of the temple. In Jesus' day, they no longer had uh, priests who were descended from Aaron. They had lost all of that. And so what they were doing was they had the Sadducees who were in charge of the temple. Now, just so you know, the Judaism that survives today is the, Pharise is the Judaism of the Pharisees. And the reason for that is because the Sadducees were tied to the temple, and when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, no more Sadducees. And so they were in charge of the temple. And so the Pharisees say to Jesus, when the people are quoting from the Psalms, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Pharisees say, Jesus, tell them to shut up. And he says, no. And then, so he challenges their authority, the Pharisees, right? And then he marches right into the temple, and he challenges the authority of the Sadducees. So he takes off both sides. And he walks in, and he cleans house. And he says, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the scripture he's quoting here is God being angry about the fact that the temple and the Jewish people haven't been pointing the way to him for the entire world, for the nations. And so here, this, this money changers and the animals and all that's going on, the problem was it was the only place the Gentiles could pray. This was in the court of the Gentiles. They weren't allowed to go into the inner part of the temple. And so Jesus, is, Jesus stops this and he cleans house. Now look at what happens at verse 47. So you got to tie all these together to see why this is important. If you read this verse just by itself, maybe it wouldn't totally make sense, but I hope that it will now. Look at this. 
Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people. So this is the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. We're trying to kill him. He's teaching at the temple, and they're trying to kill him. Let's go back to verse 47. Now, what is happening here? Here's basically what Jesus did. Jesus moved in to their house. It would be like if you showed up at your house one day and the locks had been changed and someone else's furniture was there and somebody else's family pictures were on the wall and somebody else had moved in. And all your stuff is in the dumpster. Jesus comes in and he clears out the temple and he cleans it and he takes it over. So the rest of the week of Jesus' last week before he's crucified, this is where he spends every day. He takes over the temple as his classroom. He takes over the temple as his position of authority. He takes over the temple as his office. He takes over the temple as his place where he is teaching the people. And the final week in Jesus' ministry, he lives basically at the temple during the day. So he just moves into their space, cleans it out, and then he takes over. And so him teaching at the temple here is a really big deal. Earlier, the first time Jesus had cleansed the temple, he said, if you tear down this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. John tells us, well, really, he was talking about himself. Because Jesus is the new temple. In John chapter 1, John says that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The tabernacle was the first version of the temple. It was God's presence with his people. And now the new God's presence with his people is Jesus. Jesus is the new temple. People had looked at the, to the temple as God's presence being with them. When they went to go be, be with God, they went to the temple. The temple meant for them that God is with us. And Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the new temple. And so the new temple, the permanent temple, the temple that, that was designed to be the one for us for eternity, walks into the old temple and gives the old temple its last glorious days, which is hosting the real temple for a week while he teaches. And so this is a really big deal. Now, they've already wanted to kill him, but th there's even more reason now because he's taken over their space and he's claiming authority for himself. Authority as the Messiah and authority as the chief teacher and leader and ruler and king over the people. And hey, that's our spot. I wonder today in which ways People get mad at Jesus, although they don't want to say it that way. But we want to be in charge of our own lives, right? Like, Jesus, like, church stuff, that's yours. Right? It cracks me up when in the hallway, and this happens. I'll be standing out there in the hallway, and I'll be talking to somebody who's come by for some reason. could be anybody. And they'll, and they'll say a cuss word. <laughs> and they'll be like, oh, I said it in church. I shouldn't have done that. I said, God's going to hear you say that wherever you are. So, I, you know. But we like God for him to just be in his space, right? So that's okay. I'll follow God's rules, you know, at church. But in the rest of my life, that's my space. And I can do what I want. And I wonder if, if God looks down on us and says, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's adorable. You think you're actually in charge. You know, like the toddler in the back seat with the toy steering wheel thinking he's actually turning the car. That's so sweet. Until that toddler locks the doors and actually starts the ignition and gives it a real shot, right? Then all of a sudden it's not sweet anymore. Now it's dangerous. And we take over like that. It becomes dangerous. Look at verse, verse 48. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. See, their authority came from the people. And they, they couldn't just stop him. Because Jesus is teaching with authority, and the people love it, and they're listening. So how do we win our power back? How do we win our popularity back? How do we win the hearts and the minds of the people back? So they have a plan. Look at verse 49. 
one day, so he does this all week, okay, so they pick a day during the week, so we don't know specifically which day, but he keeps going back week after week, day after day in the temple, and he takes it over, and this is his place. He's cleaned it out, it's mine. One day, as Jesus was teaching the, temp, the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. In other words, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they get together, and they walk up to him. They have a plan. We're going to stop this. And so in front of the people, they interrupt Jesus' classroom. They interrupt his teaching. And they say in front of everybody else, tell us by what authority you are doing these things. Who, who gave you this authority? Now, what do they mean by these things? They may mean him riding into Jerusalem like some kind of a king on a donkey. They mean him turning over the tables of the money changers and driving the people and the animals out. And they also mean taking over and hanging out like, like you own the place. Which, by the way, he does. But to them, he's just, he's just acting. Look at verse 3. Here's what this reminds me of. It reminds me of those scenes in movies where somebody walks into their house and it's the teenager, right? The teenager is throwing a big party. <laughs> and the person walks into the house and, and starts saying, get out, everybody get out. You know, it's a wild party going on and some, some guy goes, hey, who are you, man? He says, I live here. This is my house. Oh. And so Jesus moves in. And the Pharisees go, who are you, man? And Jesus says, this is my house. He replied, I will also ask you a question. So they, they try to stump him, and here's, here's what they want from him. They probably want this answer. They probably want him to admit that he didn't ask permission. He did not, he did not go to the non-commissioned officer in charge and fill out the proper paperwork. He did not get permission from the general. He didn't go to the CEO or the principal. He did, not, he did not get the proper papers or authority. He did not ask the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees if he could do this stuff. And so it looks like what they're trying to do is get him to admit that. Jesus obviously recognizes they're trying to trap him and, and lure the people away and discredit him. And he knows exactly what they're doing, uh, which, by the way, is really interesting to me. Um, you know, if you use a basketball analogy, if you, even, even on today, if you don't mind my using a basketball analogy, you know, don't take Jesus on one-on-one because -on -one, you're going to lose, right? Don't take Jesus on 10 to 1 because you're going to lose. Don't take Jesus on 50 to 1 because you're going to lose. And he's got moves you haven't thought of. So look at what he says. Look at verse 4. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or of human origin? Oh, okay. So, so he gives them a question. And so he says, if you'll tell me this, then I'll, then I'll answer your question. Go ahead. Look at verse 5. Oh, wait, quick cuddle. Can you give us a second, Jesus? You know, as they come over here and they huddle, what do we got to do? You can almost hear the whispering. How do we answer this? And so Luke tells us this is what happens in the huddle. If we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? Next verse, verse 6. But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they were persuaded that John was a prophet. See, here's what Luke told us earlier in his gospel. Luke told us that all the, pro all the people love Jesus. And they were baptized by Jesus. Not, I'm sorry, not Jesus. All the people love John the Baptist. They were baptized by John the Baptist, even the tax, tax collectors. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not. And so all the people are flocking to hear John the Baptist and they're repenting of their sins and being baptized by him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are standing back here like this and the people know it. And here's the thing. They're kind of in trouble here because their whole point is to win the hearts of the people 
And if they say of human origin, the people will stone us. There's no way we're going to keep our authority because they love John. In fact, did you know there's even a religion today that believes in John the Baptist and not Jesus? I mean, John was a really big deal. But if we say, well, it came from God, then the natural question is, why didn't you believe John then? Right? Because John pointed to Jesus. John said that he was not even worthy to tie Jesus' to sandals. And when asked by the Pharisees, are you the Messiah? He said, no, but I'll show you who is. And so they're in trouble either way. They can't answer. Look at verse 7. And so they answered, we don't know where it was from. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then he tells them a story. Look at verse 9. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. He's standing in the temple right when they're challenging his authority when he tells this story. And on the, on the wall, going into the holy place, there's this beautiful gold vine that had been put there by Herod. And the really rich Jew Jews would, you know, on those special occasions, would buy a jewel to be added as a grape on the vine. And they could point, see, that one's mine. I put that for up there for Uncle Levi. Because to the Jews, the, the vineyard represented Israel. In fact, the scriptures over and over and over again use that imagery for Israel. And that Israel is God's vineyard. And so they knew that. And so for Jesus to, to talk about a vineyard here, it would be as, as if I suddenly mentioned, mentioned Uncle Sam or the Statue of Liberty or a bald eagle. You know what I was talking about. And so they know he's talking about Israel. A man planted a vineyard, ran into some farmers, and went away for a long time. Look at verse 10. At the harvest time, at harvest time, he sent his servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Now, it would have been obvious to him, to them. Now, not all Jesus' parables are allegories, but this one clearly is. That the the vineyard is Israel, and the leaders, the tenants here, the farmers, are the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the servant of the man are the prophets, because the owner of the vineyard is God. And this is what they did to the prophets. Isaiah, according to tradition, was sawn in half. Zechariah was stoned uh, near the temple. Elijah was forced to go out into the wilderness. And there are countless other prophets, we don't even know all of their names, who had been rejected by the Israelites when they said things that the Israelites didn't want to hear. Look at verse 11. He sent another servant. But that one they also beat and traded shamefully and sent away empty-handed, which is what we do when people tell us things we don't want to hear. Verse 12, he sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Verse 13, and then the owner of the vineyard, who in the story is God, said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love which is what God had said at Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. When I, I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. Now this is in the context of the story. God knew exactly what was going to happen with Jesus. Okay. But to make the story make sense, here's the motivation of the owner. Look at the next verse. But when the tenants saw him, they talked and the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Now, here within the context of the story, the mindset is this. Legally speaking, if the owner abandons the land, they get it. And so if the son is coming, maybe that means because we haven't heard from him in a while that the owner's actually dead. And so if we kill the next owner, stash his body, it'll be like, we never saw anybody. 
and now it's ours. So within the context of the story, that's their motivation. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Look at verse 15. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, the people, may this never be. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And Jesus here predicts what's going to happen in just a few days. That the son himself is going to give up his life. Now we know why Jesus does this. He does this because he not only loves the vineyard, meaning the people, he also loves the tenants and dies even for those who kill him. Look at verse 17. And in response to the people who said, may this never be, Jesus explains to them this is exactly God's plan. He looked directly at them and he asked them, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. He says this to the people. And many of those same people a few days earlier had, had sung from Psalm 118, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus here is quoting from the same psalm. He's quoting from the same exact song that they had sung in praise of him. And, he's, and what he's saying is, this is what God intended. This is the plan. This is what's going to happen. And Jesus is that stone that the builders reject. And God says, this is going to be the cornerstone of everything. And Jesus is the new temple. But there's more. And he quotes another scripture. Look at verse 18, or he refers to it. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. This is from another psalm. And here's what he's saying. You can build on me. Right? You can build on me as the cornerstone. And what you build will last forever. Or you can trip over me and be broken to pieces. Or you can reject me and be crushed. Those are your choices. It's either salvation, this stone is either salvation or it's destruction. And that's it. And this is what we're faced with in our own lives. We have these lives that we've been given to temporarily. And God says, if you want to cling to that throne, now that the rightful king has arrived, you can do that. But it will mean for you destruction. But to give that throne to the rightful king means salvation and rescue. Verse 19, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. And so uh, here's two things to think about. The first thing is, uh, who's in charge of your life? Now, I know the answer to that, and so do you, but we don't always act like it, do we? And so the true king has landed. Are you going to give him his throne? Because guess what? He's going to get it one way or the other. And when we give him his rightful place, what we find is not, oh no, somebody else is in charge of me and I get bossed around. What we find is we are able to become what we were truly designed to be in the first place because you and I were not created to be king over Jesus. It's his throne, not ours. This, this life that you've been given, it belongs to him, not yours. And when you give it to him, that's when you actually find true freedom. Have you ever done a job or your boss gave you something and you started working on it and you were way over your head? You did the best job you could, but you know what? You knew it wasn't very good and somebody else could have done it way better. The truth is that when you give your life to Jesus, you'll find the one who can do it real way better is actually in charge now. And you have the peace and the freedom that you've been looking for all along. In order to rescue us and to give us his peace, the son comes and he gives his life. And so at this time, we're going to celebrate 
uh, the Lord's Supper together. And yes, I said celebrate, because in giving his life, he gave us our lives. In dying for us, he rescued us from death. In giving up his life willingly, his sinless life, he rescued us from our sins so that we could be forgiven for other, forever. If you are here and you are a Christian, you know Jesus as your Savior, you invited to join with us in this. I want to invite to the deacons and the ushers to come forward at this time as we celebrate together. And let me tell you what we're going to do a little bit different today. I want to give you a chance both of reflection and response to God's word as you've heard it today. And so our chance for reflection is going to happen while the bread and the cup are being passed out to you. So as you hear the music playing and as you're waiting for the bread to come, as you're waiting for the cup to come, this is your chance to reflect on what God has been saying to you through his word today. Now you're going to get the bread and then followed by the cup, and we're going to wait uh, to partake of those things. Because after we, we all have it, including, including our deacons, and they're going to go and sit with their families, uh, we're going to sing a verse from the old rugged cross. And as you're holding that bread, which represents the body of Christ, broken for you, and as you're holding that cup, which represents the blood of Christ, shed for you, and we sing the old rugged cross, we remember what the one true king gave up so that we might have true and eternal life. And then, after we sing that song, we will partake together, and we'll be given an opportunity to respond. But first, we have a time of reflection. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are still learning. I am still learning. I'm still I'm excited to learn what it means for Jesus to come and to give up his life. To, to see and to experience and to think about what it is that he has done for me. I never tire of it, and I have not yet gotten to the bottom of all of what that means of what you've done for me. Lord, I praise you for that today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open up my eyes a little bit more and open the eyes a little bit more of those who are here that we might experience and be reminded a little bit more of what Christ has done for us. And so we know that this, this bread and this cup are not magic. But, Lord, they are tangible things that you have given us to point to what Christ has done. And so, Lord, as we, re as we reflect, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word and the Holy Spirit would, would convict us, challenge us, and encourage us. Whatever it is we need to hear from you, that we would hear that as we reflect on what Christ has done for us. And so we thank you for this bread and for the body of Christ broken for us. We thank you for this cup and the blood of Christ shed for us that cleanses us of our sin. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.